My name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the HESI. We have been solving math problems out of this book here the HESI Admission Assessment Exam Review, the third edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Right now, we are in the process of solving problems having to do with the notion of ratios and proportions. Ratios and proportions, and right now we are in the middle of solving the sample problems that you find on page number 28. The sample problems. Please turn to it, page number 28. We did the first five, one through five yesterday, and today we're going to pick up from number six. We're going to go through six through ten. Okay. After having watched these 10 sample problems and the 5 examples that we did day before yesterday, if you feel that you still need more help, if you feel that you still need to have more practice on the concept of uh, ratios and proportions, there are a couple of more videos you can watch. T is math, day number 33 and day number 34. As I have pointed out to you several times in the past, the math that one encounters on the T's is very similar, very comparable to what you will encounter on the HESI. So if you need to have more practice, Day number 33 and day number 34 in the series of T's is what you want to watch. In addition to that, here are some videos in the, from the basic math from day number 51 through 65, 15 videos dealing with the notion of percentages, fractions and decimals. Percentages, fractions and decimals, how to go back and, from, back and forth one from the other. Watch those videos and you will improve your skill. You will feel more comfortable. Number six. Number six. That's the key. The, the, the recipe is very simple. The, uh, the idea is very simple. The more you practice, the more comfortable you will become with the numbers and with the problems. And you'll be calmer during the exam, therefore. You'll be calmer because you will say to, because you will say to yourself, been there, done that. 15 to x. 15 to x is to 3 to 8. 3 to 8. That's how, that's how it is read. We learned that yesterday, we learned that day before yesterday as to how to go about reading this statement. This statement is to be read as 15 to x. This thing is 2. x is 2 is 2. That's how this thing is read. This, these four dots are read as is 2. 3 to 8. 3 to 8. 15 to x means 15 over x is 2 means equals 3 to 8. 3 to 8. What can we do here? That's a tricky one here. It is a tricky one. Well, we see 15 on the top. Let's, let's keep it simple. There is 15 on the top. Let me, let's keep it very simple. This is 15 on the top here and there is 3 on the top here. If we can make this top the same as that top, if we can match the numerator, if the numerators are the same, the denominators would have to be equal. How can we convert 3 into a 15? It's very simple. Multiply 3 by 5. Multiply 3 by 5. 3 times 5 is 15. We have the 15 on the top now on this side. We can't just leave it like that. We can't simply multiply the top by 5. If we do that, we'll, we, will, we will have changed the value of the fraction that is given to us on this side. If you can multiply top by 5, we must multiply the bottom by 5. And now we have not changed anything because 3 over 5, 3 divided by, 5, 3 divided by 8 is still... 3 over 8 is still 3 over 8 because we're simply multiplying that quantity by 5 over 5 which is 1. You can multiply any quantity you want by 1, it doesn't change anything. So that's it, we're done. So 15, this 15 here we have is same as 3 times 5 which means the x that we have here must equal 8 times 5. x equals 8 times 5 which is 40. It would have to equal 40 because that's the only way it's going to work out if the numerators of the two fractions are equal to each other so must the denominator. Otherwise the two fractions will not equate, two fractions will not equal to each other. Number seven. Number seven. We're being asked to solve the next one. It says solve the proportion, solve for x. Number seven says 360, 360 to 60 is to, is to 6 to x. 6 to x. We did a very similar we, we did a very similar question yesterday. We did a very similar question yesterday. Let's see if I can find it very quickly. 
No, it was not yesterday, it was day before yesterday. Example number five on page number 27, day before yesterday, day number 37, or rather 38, day number 38. We did a similar question. So what we have to understand here is that, what we have to understand here is that these two zeros that we see here, this zero right here and this zero right here, they do not serve any purpose. They are just there to annoy us. They are just there to intimidate us. They are just there to irritate, irritate us, wax us, fret us. Your job is not to get annoyed. Your job is to stay calm and collected. Why do they not play any role? Because if you divide this quantity by 10, if you divide that quantity by 10, they're going to drop out. Top and bottom, this, appears, this is going to appear on the top and this is going to appear on the bottom. If you divide top and bottom by 10, on the left hand side, the zeros are going to drop out immediately. You will see it in a second. So here we have, this was question number 7 I believe. So here we have 360 to 60 is to, which is equal, is to 6 to x. 6 to x again. You see, we have here 0 on the top, we have 0 on the bottom. Both of these quantities end in a 0. That tells us that both of these quantities, top and bottom, they are both multiples of 10, which means they have a common factor of 10, both of them. Why don't we divide top and bottom by 10? Let's divide 360 by 10, divide 60 by 10. Question is, how are we going to show our work? Are we going to show our work like a baby? Or are we going to show our work as a grown-up person? As a grown-up person, if you want to divide top and bottom by 10, all you, all you do is this, knock out the zeros. That's it. That's it, we're done. Let's divide top and bottom by 6 and see what happens. Let's just see what happens. If you divide top and bottom by 6, 6 is going to go away and 36 becomes 6. Well, there you go. Oh, this is strange. Oh, that must be it. 6 divided by 6 is 1. 6 divided by 6 is 1. Oh, there you go. This is a very strange question. Now watch what happens. What are we left with? What are we left with on the top? On the top, we are left with a 6. On the top, we are left with a 6. Same as this guy right here. That's all we have on the top. Since top is same, since this here we have 6 and here we have 6, since the numerator of this quantity, the left hand side is the same as the numerator of that quantity. Now I'm speaking in a very, very formal way, very academic way, very geeky way, very nerdy way, the numerators. Since the top are the same, the bottom must equate also. Hence, x must equal 1. x must equal 1. That's the only way this equation is going to hold. Number 8. Number 8. We are told that x to 81, or rather x to 81, x, x x to 81 is to 9 to 27. 9 to 27. How do we read this thing? This is read as x to 81 is to, is to, this quantity, is to, this thing is, is to 9 to 27. And how do we write this in the form of an equation? Very simple. x divided by 81, x over 81 is to means equals 9 over 27. 9 over 27. What can we do here? What can we do here? Well, we see 81 over here, we see 27 over here. Are you able to see that 81 and 27, 81 is a multiple of 27. How many 27, how many 27 will make 81? How many 27 will make 81? 3, the answer is 3. 27, 27 times 3. I was pausing here for a second because I was debating whether or not to continue with this method or show you a simpler method. So since I started it, we're going to finish it and then I'm going to show you the simpler way, okay? 27, which simpler in the sense that here we have to be able to recognize that 81 is simply 3 times 27. And if you're not able to see that, if you're not able to see that 81 is simply 3 times 27, then of course it's difficult to approach it in this manner. But since I started it, I'm going to finish it. 7 3 is at 21, 1, carry 2, 2 3 is at 6 plus 2 is 8, you see? You see it's 21 divided, 21 times 3 is 81. So if this is 81 and this is 27, if we were to multiply that quantity by 3, 
then 27 times 3 becomes 81. Now the bottom is same as that bottom. The, the denominator here is same as this denominator. Since we multiply the bottom by 3, we must multiply the top by 3 here to make sure that this quantity is not changed. We are, we are taking the 9 over 27 and multiplying by 3 over 3. 3 over 3 is just 1, so we are not changing anything. That's it. So x must be 9 times 3. x must be 9 times 3. 9 times 3 is 27. 9 times 3 is 27. So that was one way. Now let me show you a different way. So here we have 9 over 27. We have to get rid of this 81 from the, from the, from the bottom here. How, do, how can we get rid of this 81 from the left hand side? Very simple, very straightforward. Let's multiply both sides of the equation by 81. If we multiply this side of the equation by 81, multiply that side of the equation by 81, and now 81 divided by 81 is just, they're going to kill each other, and we are left by x by itself. And that's exactly what we wanted. x, this turns out, is 9 over 27 times 81. Let's simplify, shall we? I hope you are able to see that you, you must know your 9th table, otherwise you can end up sitting there dividing by 3. The, the smaller the factor that you start out with, the more work you'll end up doing, because there are more steps you'll have to get, go through. Let's divide top and bottom by 9. 9 3 is 27. 9 divided by 9 is 1. 27 divided by 9 is 3. Now let's divide top and bottom by 3. Is 81 divisible by 3? Is 81 divisible by 3? The answer is yes. Because 81 is made up of 8 and 1. The sum of the digits, the sum of the digits of 81 is 8 plus 1, which is 9. And since the sum of the digits of 81 is divisible by 3, 81 must be divisible by 3. Let's divide 81 by 3. How many 3's does 8 have? 8 has 2 3's. 2 3's are 6. 8 has 2 3's. 2 3's are 6. After we take away 6 from the 8, you're left with 2. That 2 goes and joins the 1, becomes 20, 21. And 21 has 7 3's. Since we divided the top, since we divided top by 8, since we divided the top by 3, we must divide the bottom by 3. 3 divided by 3 is 1. So what are we left with? It turns out that x equals to 1 times 27, which is 27 over 1, which is just 27, which is exactly what we said earlier that x must be. Let's do the penultimate question, question number 9. Question number 9. The penultimate question, the second to the last question. Penultimate is just a very fancy way of saying second to the last, as you already know, because we have come across this word many a times, almost in every video. And whenever we do second to the last problem, we proclaim that we are about to do the penultimate problem. Penultimate, we learned it on day number 11. Just type in, just type in vocabulary words, vocabulary words, day 11. And you will see the video where we learned about penultimate, second to the last, number three, number nine. We are told that three bags, three bags cost four dollars and fifty cents. How much for five? How much for five? Well, there are, there are a couple of ways you can go about it. There are a couple of ways you can go about it. You could actually solve it just because you're talking about ratio and proportions. You could set it up as a proportion problem or you can simply do it as a simple arithmetic problem. We'll do it both ways. I'm going to show you both ways here. Let's do a simple, let's sim let's do a simple arithmetic pro pro process first. Simple arithmetic process tells us that 3 costs $4.50. I hope that you're able to see that if 3 costs $4.50, that, that implies that 1 must cost one dollar and fifty. Because dollar fifty, dollar fifty times dollar fifty plus a dollar fifty is three dollars. That will be two two bags. And if you were to buy one more bag, that will be four dollars and fifty cents. If each one of them is costing dollar fifty, then dollar fifty times three is four dollars and fifty cents. So one one must cost dollar fifty. The question is, how many do five cost? That implies that five must cost five must cost five times dollar fifty. 5 times $1.50. How much is 5 times $1.50? 5 times $1.50, by the way, is same as 5 times 1.5. If you want to look at it in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, dollars, instead of, instead of dealing with dollars and cents, if you want to look at it in terms of dollars, 
I'm making it far too complicated. It's 750. 5 times 1 is 5, and 5 times half is 2.5 is 750. I'm not going to do it this way. This was a silly thing. This was a damn silly thing for me to do. Just multiply $1.50 by 5. 5 times 5 is 5, obviously. And then 50 cents, if you take, if you take 50 cents 5 times, five, 5 sets of 50 cents is $2.50. It's $7.50. So that's one way. Another way is to set it up as a proportion problem, which is very straightforward, very simple. We are told that three, three cost proportion problems. You have to first show, you have to first show what the proportion is. I'm going, I'm going to erase this part. I'm going to erase this part so that we have more room. Let's, sort, let's set it up as a proportion problem. So in the proportion problems, we have to first show which two quantities we are dealing with, which quantity goes on the top, which quantity goes on the bottom. Let's put. We, we are told that three bags cost. Four dollars and fifty cents. So three bags. So we have bags and dollars. We are told that three costs four dollars and fifty cents, which I'm going to write it as four and a half. The question is, how much for five? There you go. How much for five? If you cross multiply, if you cross multiply three times x, three times x has to equal five times four and a half. As you can quite see, it's going to get quite nasty. It's going to get quite complicated. Uh, I, I don't quite like it, but since we started, we had to finish the damn thing. I shouldn't have gone there. I shouldn't have gone there. Let's divide the both sides by 3. If you divide this side by 3, we have to divide this side by 3. 3 is going to go away. And x equals 5 times 4.5 over 3. I don't like this 4.5 business. Do you like this 4.5 business? I don't like it. Let's multiply top and bottom by 2 so that we can convert this into a whole number. 4.5 times 2 is 9. Four and a half times two is nine. So we end up with five times nine over three times two. Over three times two. As you can see, this is this is very academic, very nerdy, thoroughly unnecessary, thoroughly uh, gratuitous. Just think do it in a straightforward way. If four of them, if three of them cost four dollars and fifty cents, one of them must cost $1.50. If one costs $1.50, the five will cost $7.50 for crying out loud. Don't, don't turn, it, turn it into a misery like that. Let's divide top and bottom by three. That's it. So we end up with nine times three, which five times three, which is 15. 15 divided by two, 15 divided by two. Fifteen divided by two, which is seven and a half. Seven and a half dollars, or as we said it, seven dollars and fifty cents. Let's do the very last one. That was not fun. That was not fun at all. If you can keep it simple, keep it simple. Don't turn it into a nerdy problem, a nerdy way, unnecessarily. Four cups, we are told, make 144 cookies. Four cups make, not makes, four cup make 144 cookies. How many cups for 90? How many cups for 90? That's what the question is. How many cups for 90? Again, we're going to set it up as a proportion problems. The two items that we're dealing with here are cups and cookies. Cups and cookies. We are told a recipe states that the four cups of sugar. Right now I'm reading the problem to you verbatim. You must have the book in front of you each and every time. Read the problem with me. It says, the recipe states that the four cups of sugar will make 144 cookies. How many cups of sugar are going to be needed if we are to make 90 cookies? But that's exactly what we have here. Cups and cookies is what we're dealing with. Why cups and cookies? Because I see the word cups first. Whatever comes first in the problem, that's what I do the first. Cups and cookies. And we are told that four cups make 144 cookies. Question is, how many cups, how many cups, that's the unknown, how many cups, how many cups, the cups are on the top, for 90. There you go. Let's rewrite this thing without this part here, so it's easy to see. So what we have is 4 over 144 equals x over 90. We need to get rid of the, get rid of the 90 from the bottom here on this side. We do that by multiplying both sides of the equation by 90. So far so good. 90 goes away. 90 disappears. And there is your x. This is our x. All we have to do is simplify this thing. 
all we have to do is simplify this thing and let's see what we can do. I'm going to change the color and we're going to actually do it on the top so this is, there is some more room. So x equals x equals 90 times 4 90 times 4 over 140 1, 144 144 Let's divide top and bottom by 4 How do we know that 144 is divisible by 4? Now if you did not see, if you are unable to see that 144 is divisible by 4 then you can end up doing more work, you can end up doing extra stuff because you are going to have to start your process by dividing by 2 how do we know that 144 is divisible by 4? Because we have watched our videos in a series of basic math and we know how to recognize if a number is divisible by 4 or a 5 or a 3 or a, uh, or a 6 and so on and so forth. A number is divisible by 4, listen very carefully, a number is divisible by 4 as long as the last two digits of the number are divisible by 4. Last two digits of 144 make 44 and since 44 is divisible by 4 144 must also be divisible by 4 hence divide top and bottom by 4 let's divide top and bottom by 4 we want to divide top and bottom by 4 so that we can get rid of this 4 this 4 is gone it becomes 1 let's begin the process we're going to divide 144 by 4 are you ready how many 4s does 1 have 1 has no 4 1 is too puny to have any 4 1 is too puny that 1 goes and joins the 4 and becomes 14. He goes to the 4 and says, look, I'm too puny. I can't take on a 4. Can you please help me? Let's gang up. They gang up and they become 14. How many 4s does 14 have? 14 has 3 4s. 3 4s are 12. 3 4s are 12. After we take away 12 from the 14, we are left with 2. That 2 goes and joins the 4 and becomes 24. And 24 has 6 4s. That's it. We're done. Let's divide top and bottom by 6. Again, how do I know that 90 is divisible? 36, of course, is divisible by 6 because 36 is the perfect square. 6 is square. How do we know that 90 is divisible by 6? Again, we learn all of this thing. Look for the rules of divisibility. Rules of divisibility. A number is divisible by 6. Listen carefully. A number is divisible by 6 if it happens to be an even number, which 90 is. If it's an even number, then that means that it's divisible by 2. That's what even number means. Even number means that the given number is divisible by 2. 90 is an even number, therefore it's divisible by 2. And the sum of the digits of 90, and the sum of the digits of 90 is just 9 plus 0, which is 9. Since the sum of the digits of 90 is divisible by 3, 90 must be divisible by 3. So now we have established that 90 is not only divisible by 2, because it's an even number, but it's also divisible by 3, because the sum of the digits of 90 is divisible by 3. Hence, if the number is divisible by both 2 and 3, the number must be divisible by 6. You got it? Let's do it. So 36 divided, I'm going to change the color one more time so that we don't continue with the red. 36 divided by 6 is just 6. Let's divide 90 by 6. How many, how many 6 does 9 have? 9 has 1 6. 9 has 1 6. After we, six, after we take away 6 from the 9, we have a remainder of 3. We have a remainder of 3. That 3 goes and joins a 0. That 3 goes and joins a 0 and becomes a 30. That 3 from the 9 goes and joins, joins a 0 and becomes 30. And how many, how many 3's does 30 have? How, rather, we are dividing by 6. How many 6 does 30 have? 30 has 5 6. Because 5 6 are 30. Oh, well, we have a 6, we have a 15. Let's do one more round. Let's divide top and bottom by 3. Let's divide top and bottom by 3. 6 has 2 3's and 15 has how many 3's? It has 5 3's. That's it, that's your x. We can no longer reduce anymore. We can no longer reduce anymore. We can no longer reduce anymore because we are left with 5 on the top, which is a prime number. We are left with 2 on the bottom, which is also a prime number. Since they are prime number, of course, they are not going to have any common factor. That's where the story ends. Hence, our x, our x, it turns out, is equal to 5 divided by 2. 5 divided by 2. 5 divided by 2 is simply 2 and a half. Voila. The answer is, you're going to need two and a half cups of whatever the hell you need there, sugar, to make a, to make the cookies. 
they made no mention of the third ingredient that you need in order for your cookies to be happy cookies. We won't go there, okay? Because this is no longer 60s, so we don't make happy cookies. We're just going to make regular cookies. Bye now.